ag against uh, some rules that uh, have been called, uh, I believe it's open internet rules uh, by the FCC, uh, from which uh, Commissioner McDowell dissented from. And uh, Craig, ask you, uh, why, did, uh, why did Verizon file this uh, litigation against the, the FCC? Thanks, Harold. And, and first, as a prefatory comment, <clears throat> we talked a little bit. About, I'm not going to comment on the litigation itself. Uh, there, there are a lot of theories, opinions out there on panel selection, <clears throat> et cetera, et cetera. And as a part of the case, we're not going to uh, get into that. But as a, as a policy matter, fundamentally, uh, as, as Harold mentioned, the, the references to the open internet order. And what this case is not about is whether the internet will continue to be open. It will be, there's been a commitment to an internet for a long time predating the FCC order on this. For us, fundamentally what this case is about is, an, is a jurisdictional agency matter. This is about where the FCC's jurisdiction ends and the FTC's jurisdiction begins, frankly, in terms of regulation over the internet ecosystem. If you look at what the FCC did here, uh, there's a fairly expansive view of its jurisdiction uh, under an ancillary jurisdiction uh, theory that allows it to regulate parts of the internet ecosystem that concerns us and I think should concern many players in the internet ecosystem. Uh, if you look at the order, for example, the FCC talks about the fact that it will forbear from applying the open internet order to Wi-Fi and coffee shops. Of course, the implication is that it could apply the FCC's jurisdiction to Wi-Fi and coffee shops. And it leads to some fundamental uncertainty about how far the FCC will continue to stretch this jurisdictional theory over new areas of the internet. So for us, it's very important that we have certainty in terms of what the regulatory regime is, what the extent of the FCC's jurisdiction is. That does not mean that there will not be any rules or any backstops in terms of activity on the internet. Again, the FTC, for example, has plenty of jurisdiction to protect consumers, to deal with competition law issues, but we feel that the FCC should not be creeping its jurisdiction into these areas. Commissioner McDowell, you've looked at these rules for, for many years. <coughs> Could you tell us what the FCC rules are, and uh, uh, are they consistent with uh, the Commission's uh, statutory authority? Well, first of all, uh, thank you for uh, putting this panel together. I think it's uh, very timely, especially with the selection of, of the judicial panel a couple of weeks ago, and now that we have an oral argument date of September 9th. Uh, so Hudson's timing is, is perfect. Everyone should know that at any moment now, uh, Commissioner Furchgott Roth could have to scramble up to the Northeast Corridor because he, he could become a grandfather. So the, uh, there's a, a, the bat phone may ring, and if that's the case, I will have to take over as moderator. Uh, so uh, I'm hoping uh, things can stay as they are for the next hour or so, uh, so that we don't have chaos here on the dais. Commissioner McDowell, just, just for you, I'm going to turn my phone off. <laughs> you sure this is a good idea from a family relations perspective? Uh, yes. Off or just, you know, silent? Uh, I, I am going to go all the way and turn them off. Wow. Wow. I will check it the second that this conference is over. Okay, now I'm very nervous, so we'll speak quickly. Um, maybe we'll end this a little early. No, no, speak slowly. So... So, uh, obviously, uh, I, I voted against uh, this order for a number of reasons. Uh, one, there was no market uh, failure uh, to justify uh, the FCC stepping into this space. Um, there was no market analysis done by the FCC or any other government agency um, to justify the government stepping into this space. Um, it was a very long dissent uh, with 145 footnotes or something, so I'm not going to go into every uh, corner of that dissent. Feel free to look. It's still on the FCC uh, website. You said I was distinguished. Actually, I'm extinguished as a former commissioner, <laughs> but there's a corner for extinguished commissioners, uh, the has-been corner, uh, where you can still find uh, it's, it's December 21st, 2010, sta under statements somewhere. If you find my name in there, you can you can read it if uh, you suffer from insomnia. But um, 
So uh, the D.C. Circuit actually really helped clarify uh, whether or not the FCC has the authority, uh, and that was in um, April of 2010 when they handed down a decision um, in what became known as the Comcast case. So it was the Comcast BitTorrent um, uh, case that came before the commission in terms of whether or not Comcast was acting in an anti-competitive way against BitTorrent, uh, an application provider essentially for peer-to-peer uh, applications that allow the, the sharing of uh, films, videos, uh, in many cases pirated, but no, we won't go there. That's a different story altogether. But um, so uh, the, I descended from that one as well, um, and uh, the D.C. Circuit, uh, you know, basically essentially vacated what the commission did and, and said, uh, you know, and, and appellate courts rarely to say, you're silly agency, go away, never try that again. Usually the first time around, they'll say, you didn't really explain yourself uh, properly, uh, so we're going to send this back to you. Um, but I think a lot of the dicta, the, sort of the patina from the, from that um, decision was that the, the D.C. Circuit at the time just didn't think the FCC had the authority that it was asserting uh, under Title I. Um, and so the FCC went back to the drawing board uh, to uh, issue the open Internet order on December 21st, uh, of 2010, so later that same year, uh, while at the same time in June, opening up a proceeding regarding um, classifying broadband internet access as a telecommunications service for the first time, by the way, it has never been classified as uh, uh, as a Title II uh, telecommunications service ever, uh, so that would be the first time for the classification. I want to dispel that myth right now and happy to drill down in detail on that. But that created uh, a great deal of market uncertainty. The day the FCC announced that in May of 2010, um, the stocks of network operators, so telephone companies and cable companies, dropped twice uh, the rate of the broader market. Uh, it was early May. I don't remember the exact uh, date of 2010. The broader market went down a lot that day. Um, but uh, telco and cable stocks went down at uh, a far greater rate. Um, because the, the markets uh, just hated it. Nonetheless, this sparked a whole conversation and then drove uh, some market players, some network operators, into the corner of uh, reluctantly and maybe under coercion of accepting uh, begrudgingly um, the open Internet order that came out in December. And there are a lot of reasons behind that. I'm happy to go through that case by case if you want. So no, the FCC does not have the authority, long-winded way of answering your question. And as Craig said, the real question before the court is where, and this is a matter of public policy in American jurisprudence, where is the fence around the FCC's authority? And this could apply to any administrative agency. But right now, under the Open Internet Order, there is no fence, there is no boundary around this agency's authority that whatever three commissioners on the FCC, or two, if there's only a quorum, you know, they only have three commissioners now, but so two commissioners, uh, whatever they decide uh, is reasonable network management in this case, um, that is what the rules are. But given the logic underlying the open internet order, there are no boundaries to the FCC's authority. There's no limiting principle. This is something the DC Circuit pointed out in the Comcast decision. Uh, this has been briefed uh, in the current proceeding, um, and this, uh, I think, is a, is a dangerous place for us to be uh, with administrative agencies attempting to legislate. Our Constitution says that's Congress's role. Commissioner Olhausen, um, if we could stipulate that one of the purposes of the FCC's open Internet order was to uh, protect consumers on the Internet, um, and that uh, sounds a little bit like some things the Federal Trade Commission does from time to time. Could you tell us a bit about uh, what Craig described as trying to establish the boundary between the FCC and the Federal Trade Commission? Uh, and uh, if you could just tell us about what powers the Federal Trade Commission has that, that might uh, affect one's view of, of the Internet. Uh, sure, Harold. I'm happy to do that, and th thank you for having me here. It's, uh, I'm very happy to be here on such a thank you. <laughs> he is. He is. He's got a new job. Uh, such a distinguished panel. Um, and just initially, I'll g give the usual disclaimer that my views are, are are my own and not the views of the FTC. 
So, yes. Yeah. Well, I try. I try. Um, so, you know, the FTC has looked at this issue. So uh, back in a previous incarnation of my career when I was head of the Office of Policy Planning at the FTC, we actually did um, an inquiry uh, on broadband um, connectivity competition policy. And we did uh, two days of hearings, we had comments, and we issued a report on this issue in 2007. And we, we basically asked two questions. One, is there a problem? Is something happening? Uh, that's harming consumers, you know, through competition, consumer protection issues. And if there is, uh, do we have the tools to address it or are additional tools necessary? And what the report concluded was, you know, we weren't seeing much of a problem, but uh, we felt that our traditional antitrust analysis could be a very appropriate way to address any problems that might arise as well as our consumer protection authority. So I know a lot of the concerns are, were initiated, well, do consumers, uh, do they get what they pay for? Do they know that uh, their quality, or their, um, the speed of their service might be you know, affected one way or the other? That's a very traditional consumer protection kind of issue. Uh, are consumers getting uh, the benefit of the bargain that they struck? Are the promises that the company, the provider made to them being, being honored? So, um, so my view and the, the view uh, represented by the FTC staff in that two th 2007 report was we do have the tools uh, to address these kinds of issues and that an antitrust analysis, particularly a rule of reason analysis, is the best way to address this because it's very fact specific. It's looking to see whether there's a problem existing. Um, it looks to whether, um, you know, what are the exact market conditions, things like that, rather than kind of coming out with a prescriptive rule that is, is sort of a, a, like a per se kind of prohibition. Uh, Commissioner, could you uh, describe the uh, common carrier exemption uh, and um, what does that mean in terms of how the Federal Trade Commission looks at certain activities as to whether there's jurisdiction there? And just historically, how has the Federal Trade Commission uh, coordinated or not with the Federal Communications Commission on what types of issues uh, each agency would address? So the FTC Act does have a common carrier exemption. Uh, when it was adopted, um, there, were also, there are also other exemptions in the FTC Act for banking and, and, um, and some other um, areas with the idea that there was already um, a, a government body that pervasively regulated that space so that you didn't need um, the FTC as a regulator stepping uh, in there as well. You know, many, many years later, things have changed uh, dramatically. It's not a pervasively regulated, uh, m you know, monopoly um, uh, market. And so the FTC has looked at um, the common carrier exemption very narrowly. We construe it not as a status base. So if you're a common carrier, it doesn't mean you're not subject to the FTC's authority. We look at it as an activities-based exemption. So if you're a common carrier engaging in common carrier activities, those activities are not subject to the FTC's authority. Um, now, fortunately, um, broadband has not been deemed to be a common carrier activity, uh, even though if the FCC were to deem it to be such, that doesn't control the FTC's authority, but certainly it could have, you know, g give grounds for a challenge if, if it was um, considered to be uh, or reclassified to be a common carrier. So, um, so there are certain things that we can't do. Uh, and we do coordinate with the FCC on certain types of issues where the FCC needs to pay attention if it's a, a carrier doing something that's part of common carriage. And, and we have advocated many times across many administrations, uh, both Democrats and Republicans, to uh, rescind the common carrier exemption, including at a hearing this morning on robocalling. So. <laughs> uh, Craig, uh, there's some people who have claim that the uh, open internet order has led to uh, a substantial increase in uh, investment in the internet. Um, you're with one of the largest telecommunications companies in the United States. Uh, um, is, is this been your experience? Uh, no, certainly not. You know, I'm, I'm surprised to hear even the, the allegation. First, obviously there are a number of things that factor into any sort of investment environment. Uh, the one thing that I think clearly can, can depress investment is regulatory uncertainty. 
Uh, we, we go back, for example, about eight years or so now, when Verizon very famously was reluctant to build out fiber to the home while there was some regulatory uncertainty on the regulatory uh, status and ex ante price regulation, for example, from the FCC. Once that situation was clarified, we launched into a very heavy uh, period of investment, $23 billion in fiber to the home build out uh, across the U.S., which was driven purely by the regulatory certainty that we had. Uh, Quite to the contrary with the open internet, or what you've done is you've introduced a period of regulatory uncertainty uh, that, if anything, and as, as um, Rob pointed out, the, when the order was released, what you saw the impact in Wall Street uh, and in stock prices was an immediate depression. You obviously don't see that sort of impact on Wall Street if people see this as a pro-investment uh, thesis. Commissioner McDowell, um, the uh, open internet order uh, has a different effect on wireline versus wireless services. Um, and uh, the internet is increasingly a, a wireless service, although it still is a lot of wireline activity as well. Uh, could you just drill down a little bit on those differences and uh, how they may have some, some effects on the market? Sure. So the order, uh, in a way, carved out wireless, but also kept the FCC's hooks on it. Um, and as Craig pointed out earlier, the, the order goes so far as to say that they're not regulating Wi-Fi and coffee shops, for instance. Um, and, uh, but they could. So if they're forbearing from that, in their view, of course they could, because there are no, there's no fence around the FCC's jurisdiction again. Um, so... Uh, there, you know, there's a, a tip of the hat understanding or acknowledgement uh, that uh, wireless is uh, different from wireline. Uh, it is uh, shared bandwidth. So you may not realize it, but you're sharing bandwidth with your neighbor uh, over certain wireless frequencies. Uh, you're also doing that, by the way, with the coaxial cable, but that's a, a different story. Fiber is, is a different story as well. It's uh, more of a wide open frontier. So the commission tries to, again, tip its hat to acknowledge some of the technological differences. Um, but what's you know dangerous here is the door is open to the regulation of wireless. And actually, as we've seen uh, over the past uh, few years with the wireless competition report that the FCC issues, um, the statute actually calls for, uh, uh, so Congress has called for um, the commission to determine whether or not the wireless industry is competitive or not. The commission since 2010, I believe, has declined to declare the wireless marketplace as uh, competitive. Um, that's despite the average American consumer having a choice of five wireless uh, providers and all of the um, competitive benefits of uh, unlicensed wireless, so Wi-Fi, for instance, um, and what that does to help uh, mix, uh, mix up the marketplace. Um, so the concern that I have is that the commission is laying, has been slowly laying a logical foundation uh, for the regulation of the wireless uh, marketplace, whether it's through open internet um, or other, other ways as well. And after the D.C. Circuit's ruling in the data roaming uh, decision, I actually think uh, the court has determined that the commission has wide authority to, to regulate this space. So as a policy matter, with that, if that legal issue is, is resolved, or for the most part uh, resolved, um, as, as a policy matter, I think that would be a, a disservice to start piling on regulations here. We've seen the American wireless sector lead the world and continue to lead the world unabated. Uh, we have more LTE or 4G uh, subscribers in this country than any other country in the world. And um, there, it is one of the crown jewels of our economy. I, I ask the, the audience to, to name me one industry that is not affected by, by wireless, that is not made better or more efficient by wireless. So think about that. Feel free to answer. Yeah, there's, there's an, what is it? Pay phones. Pay phones. <laughs> that was good, George. That was good. Okay. That's true. Pay phones are not doing well because of wireless. Uh, but I'm bummed. You stumped me. That was good. That was very quick. You're quick. George Ford. One, McDowell, zero. Okay. Other than pay phones or wireline phones in general, um, uh, if it's the lumber industry or healthcare or anything, it's all made better by wireless. So it's been one of the crown jewels of the American marketplace, uh, American economy. 
since its inception, and I think precisely because it has been uh, lightly regulated. Um, so th the concern with the open internet order is that the commission is uh, preserving its authority or ability to try to go there, um, and the DC circuit, in a way, uh, blew wind in its sails uh, with the data roaming order. Um, and so where, you know, what is the fate of the American wireless uh, marketplace? That's a whole other conference topic, I think, but it is related to the open internet order. Hi, Commissioner Olhausen, I have a kind of a two-part question for you. Um, one, I, I know you weren't at the Federal Trade Commission when the open internet order was uh, initially uh, adopted by the FCC, at least I don't think you were at that time. In 2010, uh, I was. There. Right. Um, I was just curious about procedurally when, uh, when an agency such as the Federal Trade Commission or Federal Communications Commission adopts an order that may or might not impinge on uh, the jurisdiction of another agency. And, and Craig has indicated that was one of the purposes of the uh, court challenge was to, to clarify those boundaries. Uh, is there any behind the scenes coordination that goes on between the agencies uh, uh, before an order is adopted or circulated? Um, is, is there that type of comedy that goes on between the agencies? And second, um, just based on your uh, experience having been a clerk at the DC Circuit, uh, if you could just comment a little bit about uh, how you see this uh, court challenge shaping up. So that's a, I know two-part question that's unfair I'll, but I'll, uh, try to, I'll try to remember both parts okay. uh, rem remind me if I forget uh, so on your first question so I wasn't at the FTC in 2010 so I can't speak to that order in general but uh, but I do think it's important for agencies to uh, pay attention to the jurisdiction of other agencies I've brought this up in some of my uh, things unrelated uh, to the to uh, the open internet or order but the need to avoid institutional conflict uh, uh, where, you, where you can. I think that's a very important um, good government ki kind of thing and, and a particularly important guidance for, uh, for everybody uh, in industry and uh, the legal profession as well. Um, so I would hope, uh, you know, best practices would be that there would be some kind of, some kind of discussion. Uh, to your second question, so yeah, so I was a clerk at the DC Circuit and um, uh, you know, I, I, I was actually uh, heard the, um, the Comcast appeal argued, and uh, that was very interesting uh, to be in the back row and listen, listen to that. Uh, the judge that I clerked for was on the panel, uh, and then to see it come out. So I think, uh, you know, one of the interesting things, uh, you know, Judge Tatel wrote that, uh, the previous opinion, uh, and now he is on uh, the panel for, uh, for the upcoming appeal. And I think, um, you know, that sort of uh, gives a very good opportunity for someone who's very uh, familiar with the case, who has expressed a certain view, uh, to continue to follow to follow that view uh, in this appeal. Of course, um, some of the others ha have changed, right? We've we've uh, Judge Silberman and uh, Judge Judith Rogers on the panel now, but uh, but I think it's uh, you know kind of the key fact in this to keep an eye on is Judge Tatel's continuing role. I, I certainly can't guess whether he will be the one writing it or whether he'll be in the majority or or whether, you know, be three zero or, or what. But, um, but I think that that's really an important factor. You want me to guess? Go yeah, ahead. So I like this Craig's counsel and, and Commissioner Olhausen's handler. Um, so <laughs> neither of them really should, you know, venture into this space uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, Craig has a very important appeal before the circuit, and she's a policymaker, and we don't want her to say anything too controversial today. But I can, now that I'm liberated. And um, so I, I think uh, you know, there's a lot of, you know, Washington, a lot, a lot of people in Washington who make their living off of reading tea leaves. You know, what is Commissioner Olhausen thinking? What is the composition of the, the panel uh, for the open internet appeal? And uh, how is that uh, going to determine the outcome? But um, Judge uh, Tatel, as uh, the Commissioner pointed out, uh, uh, did write the, uh, the Comcast BitTorrent uh, decision. Um, so one would hope that not only is, uh, does the D.C. Circuit still uh, realize that its own precedent is controlling, but that a judge who voted for that uh, same type of uh, thinking would uh, feel as if it's uh, controlling as well. Uh, so I think there, I think there's one vote there. I think actually there are three votes. I think it's a three to nothing 
decision against the FCC. Uh, worst case scenario, it's two to one uh, against the FCC. Um, but I would hope that it's still a fundamental uh, cornerstone of American jurisprudence for U.S. appellate courts uh, in the same circuit to follow their own precedent. I don't think the FCC has been able to wiggle out from under the Comcast uh, decision through the uh, the text of the order or its subsequent briefing. Um, and there's been a lot of discussion regarding, uh, you know, a lot of chatter and analysis regarding the Supreme Court's Arlington uh, case, um, where that uh, uh, looked at whether or not an administrative agency, the FCC in this case, um, can determine its own jurisdiction where the statute is ambiguous. And that's an important part. So ambiguous means it could be determined both ways, ambi coming from the Greek word for both, I think. <laughs> Any Greek experts in here? I think that's the case. Um, but uh, so that does not mean an administrative agency can determine its own jurisdiction where the statute is silent, right? That silence is not ambiguity. Uh, and this is why Congress, I think in 2007, 2008 timeframe, uh, considered um, net neutrality legislation. That's because members of Congress uh, who were proponents of this realized that there was not adequate statutory language giving the FCC the authority to go in the space. That did not become law, by the way. Uh, so keep that in mind. It never became the law of the land. But if the FCC already had the authority, why would Congress have needed to introduce and vote on legislation? Um, so the statute is silent on uh, this type of regulation. The last time there was any major overhaul of um, uh, the act was in 1996. The idea of net neutrality had not been uh, thought of at that point. Um, but, and there were already other laws in the books. This is also part of my dissent, by the way, which maybe we can talk more about that in a minute, which is you know, should there be a market failure, should uh, broadband internet service providers act in an anti-competitive way? In other words, is there a concentration of market power and abuse of that power that results in consumer harm? What laws are already on the books that could help cure that? Well, in my view, there are antitrust laws. There's the Federal Trade Commission Act, but I'd love to get the expert opinion here in a minute. Um, but uh, there are tortious interference with contract claims. I mean, that, this would be trial lawyer heaven, um, in fact, RCN had a class action lawsuit brought against it several years ago, and they were, it was settled um, on this basis. And other laws that I'm not even contemplating, but so both at the state and federal level. So there's a whole arsenal of laws uh, that could be brought against uh, anti-competitive conduct should it actually ever happen in a systemic way. Um, so these are all things to, to consider, um, and I hope we can discuss some of them further. Wow. Commissioner McDowell. I have a map of something going on. <laughs> um, Craig, let me let me bring you into this conversation. Um, uh, you're heading up the uh, Verizon office here in Washington. Uh, I know there are a lot of factors that affect uh, decisions that are made at Verizon that. Uh, aren't necessarily just what goes on here in Washington or aren't necessarily just one particular court case. Uh, clearly, this is is an important case to Verizon, but if you could just uh, describe how Verizon thinks about uh, uh, investments in the Internet and the various factors that go into that, and, and where does Washington fit in, if at all, into to that decision-making process? <laughs> sure. You know, it's, it's an interesting question, and there's, there's a lot in there. <clears throat> We're, of course, all here in Washington, and we tend to, we, we live this day to day, and we tend to often see the world through the lens of Washington. But a company like Verizon, we have almost 200,000 employees out there who do not get up every day thinking about Washington. Uh, we have 200,000 employees who get up every day and think about customers. They think about winning market share, about how to give customers what they want. We are one of the largest advertising spends uh, in the country, uh, matched by some of our competitors. 
And the reason we spend billions of dollars a year advertising is because we wake up every morning thinking customers have all these choices and we want to convince them to come to us uh, rather than going to our competitors. So that's what everyone thinks about day to day. And we talked a little bit about the investment uh, before. Generally, people in the company and, and including the senior executive suite are not waking up every morning thinking, what is Washington doing and how does that drive my investments? When they do think about that, then generally what that means is we have a policy environment in which there's a lack of clarity. And I can't think of a single situation in which a lack of clarity will enhance or accelerate investment decisions. By its definition, if there is uncertainty, it's going to cause people to pull back, to hesitate, to delay decision making on investments, new product rollouts, et cetera, et cetera. So I think you know, as, a, as a preliminary point, therefore, you know, the company writ large doesn't wake up every morning thinking about Washington. We wake up thinking about customers, the rapidly evolving technological environment, the rapidly evolving market environment, and that's the way it should be. That's ultimately what policymakers should be aiming for is a clarity and a stability in a regulatory environment uh, that allows companies to invest with confidence and pursue market opportunities. I think one of the concerns that we have about this whole debate is, um, again, as we talked about, the internet, the open internet order introduces uncertainty because we simply, uh, as, as Rob's articulated very well, we don't know what the bounds of FCC jurisdiction are, and that makes it very hard to plan for the future and knowing where the FCC may go with that sort of uh, purported uh, regulatory authority. One of the things that I think we need to think about in the aftermath of a court decision, whatever that decision may be, is that we bring a level-headed and cool-minded uh, discussion to this. One of there will be people out there who will say the sky is falling, no matter what the decision is. Either, either you know, FCC now has clarity over its jurisdiction, so go FCC. You can regulate anything you want in the internet ecosystem, or you don't have authority, and so something needs to change. We need regulation. We, we need legislation. We need Title II reclassification, whatever it may be. And I think one of the things we need to ask ourselves is, you know, you, you go through and say, what is the problem? Is there a problem that needs to be solved? Uh, if there is a potential problem, does the market solve it? If the market doesn't solve it, is there a set of laws already in place that will solve it? And only if you get past that point and the answer is no, then do you look at some unique need for new legislation or regulation. And I think what we're hearing today, we haven't even gotten to the question of whether we think there's a problem that needs to be solved. Uh, and I would, I would state very strongly the answer is no. But what we're hearing is the FTC has all the tools to deal with this. So I think in whatever happens in the, in, in after a court decision, again, I think we should be mindful that this is not a question of suddenly there aren't rules, there are no protections for consumers in the internet ecosystem. The question is simply which agency is going to bring that. And then I think the final question I think we need to look at is I sometimes hear this, well, okay, maybe there's not a problem to be solved, but what's the harm? Right. What's the harm of just being safe and having these rules in place just in case something happens in the future? And again, I think there are two answers to that. One is the uncertainty that you introduce and how that impacts the investment environment. But the second thing is I don't think you can ever ask an, a, a regulatory question of saying, let's just protect for what harm may take place without asking also the corollary to that, which is what consumer enhancing behavior will be impeded by an overly broad blanket regulation. And in this case, I think there is significant potential harm. We talk about net neutrality in the abstract in the internet space, and it gets a little muddled, partly because, inter frankly, net neutrality is this term that's like an empty vessel into which people pour whatever meaning they may particularly have. And so we're not always talking about the same thing. But it's also hard because we're too close to it to see what the foregone investment opportunities are, the foregone uh, innovation opportunities are. I think if you stand back and look at something that, with which we have more experience and time and apply it, uh, you can see the examples of that. So for example, the postal system. If, if at the outset someone had said, you know, we should have a neutral postal system, that sounds like a good thing, right? It sounds like something we should all be for. It sounds like all goodness, uh, motherhood and apple pie. But in retrospect, what, what would that mean? That means if I'm a magazine distributor, I can't pay bulk rates because I value the lower rate instead of speed. I can't pay for two-day mail or overnight mail because I value speed over the lower price. 
in the abstract, you would say neutrality sounds like a great thing, but actually in practice, what you would have done would have been to preclude a lot of consumer enhancing behavior. And so I think we need to focus on that, not just now as we look at the court case, but as we look at our reaction to whatever the, uh, the aftermath of the court case is. Commissioner Olhausen, just uh, following up on uh, Craig's analogy about uh, network neutrality being an empty vessel and people pouring whatever meaning they want to in it. Um, looking at, uh, uh, I was going to say cases brought before the Federal Trade Commission, let's say complaints brought to the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, have there been complaints in the past, uh, well, during your tenure at the commission uh, that would fall in the area of uh, network neutrality? And do you foresee any change in the composition of the complaints brought before the Federal Trade Commission uh, that might uh, be affected by uh, uh, the outcome of the court case? Um, so I personally am not aware of any complaints that are net neutrality kind of oriented. Uh, but, but I did want to pick up on some of the points about the types of issues the FTC hears about and the types of issues that we have a lot of expertise in analyzing. Um, things like exclusionary conduct. A lot of the concerns that have been expressed in the net neutrality area really fall under the bucket of exclusionary conduct, so like Section 2 of the Sherman Act. Uh, we, we have a lot of experience, uh, DOJ does as well, in analyzing these. Um, it's pretty high bar to, to reach to find antitrust liability there, and, and for good reason, um, because there are effects on incentives for investment and in, in innovation, new business models, things like that. The other thing is vertical integration. A lot of the concerns involve vertical integration. That's another area where the antitrust laws have a lot of experience. and. Um, uh, you know, basically find that it's very rare that, that there's a problem that ultimately harms um, consumers. You know, price discrimination, we talked about this in our net neutrality report. Um, generally, price discrimination could be good for consumers and it could be bad for consumers. You can't tell just by saying it's price discrimination, right? You, you have to know a quite, quite a lot more about it. So these are, so while I'm not seeing complaints, you know, I'm not personally aware of complaints that sound in net neutrality, these kinds of issues, these kinds of concerns that people raise are very garden variety kinds of issues and analyses that the FTC does all the time in the antitrust area. And again, on the consumer protection front, if someone says, um, my um, you know, broadband provider told me I was going to get you know, X speed and I didn't, that's a pretty typical consumer protection case. And if, I, if you can cast your mind back to when AOL started the all you can eat um, uh, you know, um, I, it probably wasn't broadband, it was probably dial-up, right? Dial-up. Yeah. Dial-up. Uh, the FTC sued them. The FTC brought, brought an action, I think they settled it, but for uh, the fact that they couldn't um, meet their promises, because the demand was so overwhelming. But uh, so may I remind you, we did that. So, yeah, it was an advertising issue. It was an advertising issue. So we, we have the tools, we, we can deploy. And we use a very traditional, very flexible analysis that really tries to focus on, is there a harm, not just to another competitor, but harm to competition that ultimately harms consumers? Uh, and then is there a remedy for that that we can, that we can impose? So it's very fact-specific, it's very tailored, and, it, and it's very much informed by economic analysis. Rob, Rob was talking a little bit about the lack of some of the analysis of what the market is, what the economics are, that's all very much at the, at the heart of an antitrust approach. So I'm not sure that answered your question, but no, I got to does. say what it I wanted to say. it does, because I think so. it tees up. Uh, <laughs> Commissioner McNow, we just heard Commissioner Olhausen say that she's not aware of any complaints that have been brought before the Federal Trade Commission that sort of smack of network neutrality. Uh, during your tenure at the Federal Communications Commission, were there... Uh, can you describe complaints that smacked of network neutrality issues? I'm sorry, I was writing down what she was saying because I'm going to steal it later. Um, <laughs> I testify before Congress tomorrow, so you never know when this could come in handy. So, um, so uh, well, there were. Uh, so even before I got to the commission, so you had the famous Madison River case of a small phone company uh, not allowing VOIP uh, or making it difficult. 
uh, that was remedied. Um, uh, you know, Comcast BitTorrent, th there was an issue there. Um, th it was not well handled by Comcast. I think even Comcast admits that. Um, that spoke to the technical uh, aspects of cable modem services, which were really designed originally to be a, a down download uh, uh, type service rather than uh, going upstream. Um, and you have peer-to-peer -peer, um, video, which then puts a lot of constraints on the upstream, and you share bandwidth with your neighbor if you're a, a cable broadband uh, subscriber. And um, so that started to congest the neighborhood nodes and all the rest. Um, but Comcast didn't do a very good job of handling that, I don't think, in terms of notifying their consumers that this is a problem. Um, but in the, in the wake of all that, you know, just, you know, just by spotlighting... Uh, these types of allegations, they can be cured almost instantaneously. And, uh, almost immediately after that was brought to light, there was the creation of a uh, non-governmental, non-profit, multi-stakeholder group called the uh, P4P Working Group, so uh, to work on peer-to-peer -peer congestion issues. Um, so I think, you know, w one question is, if the F FCC should lose, uh, it's... Uh, the, the appeal here coming up uh, probably hopefully by year's end. Um, there'll be a lot of uh, hand-wringing and questions of well, what's going to happen next. The Title II docket is open, and we can talk more about that in a minute maybe. But I have advocated since about the 2008 time frame that uh, the FCC, the FTC, DOJ, uh, consumer groups, uh, the Internet governance community, um, and industry and academia and users and all the rest can sit down and, and form uh, something in the spirit of the multi-stakeholder internet governance model uh, to say, okay, should there be anti-competitive conduct, what are the tools at our disposal? The first tool is just spotlighting allegations, uh, assuming they're uh, bona fide, um, and seeing how they can be cured. And uh, so in each of the instances cited by the FCC leading up to the open Internet order, um, I think there were four or five, uh, you know, out of the quadrillions uh, of or quintillions of Internet communications every day, there were four or five that they could uh, point to. Each was cured uh, rather quickly. Um, and... I think there's a, just a, uh, this huge array of, uh, of weapons that the government or industry or the media or whatever can use to cure any problem that may indeed arise. And thus far, keep in mind, there has never, never been evidence of systemic market failure. Commissioner Olhausen mentioned that um, as a staffer at the FTC, she worked on the FTC's 2007 report um, that is really the only examination by government agency of the market conditions uh, and the FTC unanimously, unanim bipartisan unanimous uh, vote adopted that report saying there's not a market problem here and we're very concerned about rules uh, that could distort the market or have unintended consequences that could actually harm consumers. Um, so um, there's a lot going on here and uh, I think we need to be very careful. I would just note that Madison River was really failure to complete a call. I, I'm not quite sure I'd call that a network neutrality issue. Yeah. Um, but you were there. Yeah. I, no, I wasn't there. You were but, there. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm from the dark ages. Okay. Um, um, well, let's um, let's address the the other side of the coin let's uh let's say that uh commissioner mcdowell uh prognosis is incorrect and a miracle happens and the fcc wins uh, what what does that mean for uh the fcc and, and what does it mean for uh the boundaries of commission or agency action uh given greg that was exactly why you filed the case in the first place. Um, what happens uh, under those circumstances? Greg, do you want to? Sure, I'll take it. By the way, don't, don't believe him that he's over here writing his congressional testimony. He has a list of suggested baby names on there. I can, I can say, <laughs> in fact, right at the top, 
R Robert McDowell hurts first got Roth right there at the top is uh, number one suggestion. So it has a nice ring to it. It's uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, so uh, our so you're absolutely right. The reason we <laughs> actually you don't want to touch that. We're, you're already in trouble with your, uh, your your future. Yeah, exactly. The uh, you may we may all owe him this just for having turned off if he misses the birth. But um, as, as you know, we this was exactly our concern. So. You, you fast forward, of course, there is a question there about, about what the, the FCC does with its now reinforced authority. I think you look at a world where um, we have moved in, into a completely different reality than we were 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, certainly 20 years ago when the 1996 Telecom Act was, uh, was contemplated, negotiated, and ultimately passed which was really meant to solve you know, local long distance competition. It was a world in which internet was fairly nascent, uh, wireless was fairly nascent, it was at most analog voice. You were still thinking about a world primarily of a single network. We now live in a world with a multifaceted communications infrastructure, lots of different competition, lots of different uh, interactions, interdependencies in a complex uh, ecosystem that will continue to evolve. If you think about the pace of change, we're only six years into the smartphone revolution. You think about how much life has changed just in those six years or so. So it's hard to contemplate five, ten years down the road. But I think the one thing that you would almost certainly say is that if you look at any area of the technology, you look at video and the growth of over the top. You look at, uh, say, voice communications, and you look at the various, whether it's over the top VoIP, whether you look at the growth of wireless, et cetera, et cetera. You look at mobile broadband. It's all evolving very, very rapidly. I can't speak for the FCC, but if I were sitting in the FCC and I were looking at this technological evolution, and I now had validation from the court that I have expansive jurisdiction based on an ancillary theory around broadband rollout, I would certainly move very aggressively to continue to expand my jurisdiction across as the entire technological landscape moves further and further away from the old wireline common carrier world into these multitude of, of technologies, whether it's over the top video, it's the search issues. You know, at some point I think I would be asking myself, you know, things like the search issues uh, that, that the FTC has dealt with, could I make that argument? That's where the future is. That's the cutting edge issues. I would certainly, if it were me, I would look to uh, be in that area. And that's exactly our concern because that leads to a great deal of uncertainty about what the proper regulatory framework is for that, uh, where the proper jurisdiction lies. But it's certainly where I would take it if I were looking to move uh, my agency with its relevance as the technology changes. Mr. Olhausen. Um, so if, if the FCC wins, I think that any agency really needs to pay close attention to what it can do and what it should do. And uh, I think Rob has laid out a very good um, initial kind of threshold issue. Uh, is there a market failure? Is there something that really needs to be addressed? And, and one of the things we talked about in the the FTC report in 2007 is what direction is this market going? Is it going to where there's more choices for consumers, where there's more competition, or is it going to, uh, is it static, or is it, you know, maybe e even maturing and, um, and consolidating? Uh, and, and we said, well, the arrows are kind of pointing towards this is really a growing market. It's a dynamic market. Um, and I think the FCC should pay attention to those kinds of issues um, as well. I, you know, I would say there's, there's a number of things that, you know, a lot of the concern driving net neutrality were about these bottlenecks, right? The ability for someone to, uh, you know, the last mile provider or some bottleneck to sort of, you know, hold on to things and uh, screen things out and, and engage in some kind of anti-competitive behavior. So, so what's happened uh, in, in that time period as we look, at least for me, from 2007 to now? So, you know, huge growth of wireless. So a lot of people access the Internet through wireless now, so it's not just um, wireline. Uh, new interconnection points, uh, we've got that. Uh, content is integrating uh, into the delivery. Those content and delivery are being integrated. Um, capacity is growing very fast. Demand is growing as well, too. Um, we have new self-regulatory models like the, the BiTag, the Broadband Internet Technical Advisory Group, 
that can talk about net neutrality issues? Is there a self-regulatory option here? It's a group of engineers and they get together and it's open you know, membership. It, can that help mitigate these problems? And then again, look, what, what's the problem? Have there been you know, problems, disputes, things that really need to be addressed? So those are the kinds of factors that I would suggest that any agency think carefully about uh, before they decide that a, even if they can do a rule, should they? Should they have a, a new, new set of regulations? So, so back to the, the core question, which is, what if the FCC wins? I, I think it means the FCC has unlimited jurisdiction. There is no fence around what it can do. Uh, it can legislate contrary to what the Constitution says. And that, that's Congress's job. Um, so I think uh, provided it ties uh, its justification to um, broadband. And so Section 706 is a big... Uh, part of their argument, which really just called for the FCC to do a report and then also to remove regulatory barriers, um, uh, meaning lower regulation, uh, if uh, broadband is not being deployed in a timely manner. But uh, that's another story. Uh, so, so long as the FCC can tie any idea to broadband, it would have jurisdiction over it if the FCC wins this appeal. So uh, the FCC could get into privacy. Now, the FCC has very limited customer network proprietary information like section 222 a little bit under title three a little bit under title six as well that's all like customer information privacy but the commission could start to go more into that direction Cybersecurity as well um there have been you know over the past few years the fcc is uh some of the leadership has uh, been making noises about it should be more involved with cybersecurity. um there's really nothing uh, that uh, it couldn't uh, go more into um, it, it, as long as they make the argument that it's uh, tied to broadband deployment or adoption. Um, and that's virtually everything except for payphones, as George pointed out earlier. Um, so, but, th but that's tied to that. See, the reduction in payphones, see, yeah, is, is decreasing because of, uh, uh, because of wireless. But so, uh, and we have separate statutory authority under Title II to regulate payphones or... Um, anyway, so uh, the sky's the limit uh, if there is no tether on uh, on the FCC's authority as the result of a court decision. Well, uh, with that, I'd like to open up the floor to questions and for our online viewers, again, um, hashtag Hudson Institute with your questions. Uh, you probably will never have as distinguished a panel uh, to ask questions of on this topic. So uh, let's let's begin with the questions. Uh, this gentleman right here on the right. And, and please uh, wait for the microphone and identify yourself. All right. My name is Arnold Kling, and I know nothing about this legal issues, nothing other than what I've read in the press. And my memory is a few years ago, the side of this issue that was you know, here on K Street, lobbying for net neutrality represented uh, service providers, you know, the Googles and maybe Microsofts of the world. I don't know where those people still stand. And let me just, I mean, I don't believe this myself, but let me tr pretend I'm one of them. I, I might say that, well, certainty for Verizon means uncertainty for me. That is the uncertainty of whether my bits will be delivered. And that's, to me, the benefit of net neutrality. So is that their argument? Or maybe I'm just making that up. And what's your response? If I can take a, a shot of that, which is, um, so the application uh, industries, let's say the Googles of the world or Microsoft, you know, Microsoft was actually neutral on net neutrality in 2010. Um, Google has fiber. Excellent point. So I'll describe a company to you, which is thousands of miles of fiber across the globe connecting servers and routers. And this company offers voice, video, and data services. Did I just describe Verizon or Microsoft or AT&T or Google? And the question, the answer, of course, is all the above. Um, so from an engineer's perspective, these companies look more and more alike. And uh, I think the application providers uh, who have these types of facilities are starting to understand, at least I hope they are, that some of their advocacy over the years actually may come back around to bite them. So this comes from the school of what I call, please regulate my rival, but not me. 
right? Eventually, government wants to regulate you too, uh, rather than your rival. So for you as a consumer concerned about whether or not your bits, you know, you have an open experience and it's freedom enhancing, you can download and use the application of your choice, uh, provided it doesn't harm the network or see the content you want to see uh, with complete freedom and without frustration. The answer to that is, is competition. The fastest growing segment of the broadband market is wireless broadband. And actually, I think we're just now entering the golden era of wireless. Uh, there are frequencies now that were not considered usable just a few years ago. It used to be the discussion was all about things under one gigahertz. Well, now we're building out, we're seeing the build out of LTE above two gigahertz and experimentation in five gigahertz. So what that means is, because it's much simpler and in a way cheaper, to build wireless networks, you're going to have a more robust experience there. We see lower income people adopting wireless broadband more quickly than the affluent. Uh, and we're seeing their handheld devices, they're actually now leapfrogging the affluent who are still kind of, were, you know, for a while wedded to a, a fixed, you know, desktop computer and a, and a fixed broadband connection. So the, the answer, the cure-all is to foster competition. And I think wireless in particular offers the best hope for that. So um, yeah, keep all that in mind. If I could just comment as well, obviously I, I can't speak for Google or Microsoft, but I think I would look at it in two ways. The first question, is Robert Ticula, is I think if you look at this as a FCC jurisdictional question, you have to say if there is expansive jurisdictional authority under the FCC, what gets caught up in that? And certainly these, these other companies, business models today get caught into that. They have an equal interest in this and more. There's a question of how far that goes. Then the flip side, you say, well, what about the uncertainty? So there's an, there's an aspect of uncertainty in which we all have a, a common interest. On the other side, you say, well, what about the uncertainty they have that say we might block, I think you said, if we blocked access to Google? Um, I, I think the, you know, the people probably who would be most interested in paying Verizon to block access to Google would be our competitors, because I can think of no faster way to lose a huge amount of our customer base <laughs> to our competitors uh, than to do something like that. In, in my previous roles, I was a general counsel of a couple of our business units, and I can tell you I never once heard a, a product uh, pitch or an idea that involved blocking access by our customers to the type of content they want. There's just, this is one of these things you have to say, What's the basic incentive in a competitive market? And what we are all incented to do is give our customers what they want. I can't imagine first ever a, a business rationale for, for doing that, blocking access to all Google's traffic, for example. But then if you didn't, then you have to say, does the fact that there is not an open internet or, in an internet order mean that they have no recourse? I think certainly not. As Commissioner Olhausen, I think, has, has articulated very eloquently, there is an entire body of law in which these types of issues are very ably handled by the FTC, amongst other uh, other legal options. So the fact that we are out there and we've had on our website posted for many years our, uh, our principles and our commitment to the open internet principles, if we are out there telling our customers that we're going to do one thing and we fail to do that, or we, we violate that or do something exactly the opposite, I am confident that the FTC would have something to say about that, and I have no doubt that they would say they have all the tools in the arsenal to protect consumers' interest and therefore companies like Google's interest as well. Next question. Uh, yeah, we're sorry. Gentleman over here on the side. Good afternoon. My name is Todd Wiggins. I have a quick question. It should be easy for you, Mr. Uh, Silberman, um, since you're with Verizon. Uh, it's been a long time since I've seen a white pages. And so obviously things have changed because more people have wireless technology. So back to the privacy aspect, how does Verizon deal now with um, people who are basically in search of accurate phone numbers for individuals because we're not required to report uh, our phone numbers. It's, you know, looking back 20 years ago, it was, it was a big deal to get a phone and to get a phone number because there were so few of them. And so now, how do you trace people on, on the basis of their phone numbers and how do you deal with that privacy issue as, as we come forward on that? 
Yeah. Well, that's an interesting. I, I won't go deeply into that because it's it's a, it gets a little bit of talk. But I would just say you're right. You know, we Verizon have a have a long history of of taking very very seriously our commitment to our customers' privacy. We've gone back. We've gone to court. Uh, at times with parties who were seeking mass subpoenas uh, of our customers' identity over things like copy, alleged copyright violations. We're actually fighting that right now uh, with uh, so-called uh, copyright porn uh, trolls, which is a whole different story, but companies that are bringing lawsuits seeking the identity of massive numbers of consumers under broad subpoenas that we are fighting those. You know, when it comes to mobile, the as the technology evolved, a lot of our expectations have, have evolved as well. Uh, there was a time when we we all wanted our our numbers to be listed when it was just a landline phone in a phone book, because that was an easy way for us to be found. And if we didn't, we could actually apply to have an unlisted number. I think as consumer expectations in the in the wireless space have been somewhat different, where a lot of people did not want their number to be generally available because they didn't necessarily want to be reached by anyone. And so that expectation is something that's changed. And in fact, Verizon was a, a, a primary supporter in not having customers' uh, numbers listed in wireless directories if they did not want them to be so. So I think uh, we have been very consistent in our, in our fight for customers' privacy on issues like that as the technology has evolved. Uh, next question. Uh, uh, gentleman right there in the middle. Then we'll get you next. Hello, I'm Brian Tansky. I'm with Public Knowledge. Um, the conversation about the open internet uh, seems a little bit abstract sometimes. So I was wondering if there were any specific examples the panelists could bring up of uh, business decisions or ISP behaviors that we would want to incentivize that are prevented by the Open Internet Act or order. Uh, is it just a jurisdictional you know, concern that people have? Or are there specific things that you know, we want to promote some kind of activity that we can't now because of it? Uh, I, I think that that's a very good question, right? So what, what's being prevented, right? What, what, what's the opportunity cost here? Uh, you know, one of the things that struck me was, um, I guess, uh, in the uh, involved Metro PCS, right? So you had uh, an older technology uh, that could still be utilized and offer a lower cost service to consumers, but it had bandwidth constraints. So it didn't offer um, access, wide access to video. I think it just maybe was to, you, to YouTube. And there was the allegation that that violated the open internet order. And does that make sense, right? Is that really making consumers better off? Is that, I mean, you actually have um, what could be a very efficient use of an older technology to provide a lower cost service to consumers. Sure, it had to have some limits on it, right, because of the constraints of the bandwidth. But, um, I'm a little puzzled to say preventing that really makes you know, consumers be better off. So, so that, that's an example I would offer. Because there's no market power screen, uh, right? You, you tell me, right? There's no market power screen on the open internet. So. Um, yeah, Metro PCS had substantial market power. They dominated. <laughs> 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 Which is why the government recently had to break them up into uh, yes. Uh, no, that's a um. It's th th there was a great example. I was going to I was going to choose the same one. I think you could go you could go beyond that. I think Commissioner also made a reference before about vertical contracts generally. There are certain areas, certainly areas. I think we need to speculate stipulate that that potentially could be anti-competitive in all areas of, of commerce, uh, human ingenuity knows no bounds, certainly at times in vertical contracts, but there's also a vast amount of literature about the pro-consumer enhancing, welfare enhancing aspects of certain vertical contracts as well. Those are areas that I think you want companies to experiment in, and if there are areas that are anti-competitive, there are legal tools in place to handle those situations, but you don't want to foreclose uh, those. And then when you start looking even at traffic management and things like that, you know, there, there is a, a certain mythology about some of these areas in, in terms of the Internet and the way it works. And you look at even the way that most content companies evolve. You start out with a server in California somewhere, and then as you get bigger, you start building proxy servers closer to your customers, and then you start building, you start leasing uh, content distribution networks so that your traffic can, can be delivered even more quickly vis-a-vis -vis your competitors. And then if you get big enough, you may invest in your own CDNs. 
you know, these things are all part of the competitive marketplace as customers, companies constantly jockey to find ways to provide the optimal experience to their customers. That's happened since the birth of the internet in the, uh, the general network engineering space. And I think we should continue to encourage that sort of development, innovation, and, and engineering ingenuity. Excellent question. And uh, so, uh, and I appreciate your thoughtfulness on it. So I, I think there are a lot of questions. Well, first of all, there's been a lot of pause and hesitation by all, all players because of how long this appeal has taken. <laughs> You know, it was almost three years after the FCC issued its order, and there are a lot of reasons as to why it's taken this long, but it is one of the slowest cooking uh, appeals coming out of the FCC uh, that I can ever think of. Um, so during those three years, I think there's been a lot of hesitation uh, by both sides, those who would want to bring complaints to the FCC while the appeal is pending, and maybe some hesitation on the, the market and within the markets as to what can and cannot be done. I'm not going to look at Craig while I talk about this next, so don't look at his face. But you know, a few weeks ago, the Wall Street Journal ran an article, and this is all I know about it, about perhaps ESPN paying Verizon Wireless um, to help subsidize consumers who go to ESPN's website a lot, like my oldest son. And uh, would that help keep consumer rates down? Well, there was some concern expressed, I think maybe even by PK, although I can't remember, about whether or not that would violate the open Internet order, or at least the spirit of it. Um, and is that a, a bad thing? Actually, I think the experimentation like that would be a very good thing. That could be good for consumers. Um, but I think from the net neutrality advocate, you know, the pro-regulatory side, they would say, well, this is smacks of favoritism or is implicit prioritization and things of that nature. So while Craig said uh, most of the 200,000 or so employees of Verizon don't wake up every morning thinking about Washington, D.C., that's exactly what Craig is paid to do, is to wake up every morning thinking about what's going to happen in Washington, D.C., and then advise his business um, uh, folks on that, as with any wireless or cable company or whatever. So, you know, I, I think that could be good for consumers. At a minimum, let's at least let the market experiment and see what happens. Does that result in anti-competitive conduct? Does that result in anti-competitive conduct that couldn't be resolved through something the FTC or DOJ or state attorneys general could do? Um, but I think there has been hesitation. You know, why hasn't that happened already? It's been the, the, the technical and business ability has already been there uh, for uh, subsidizing consumers. And also just usage-based pricing in, in general. There's a lot of debate about uh, tiered pricing or usage-based pricing. Some advocate really for just flat pricing, which actually would harm, I think, the proverbial grandmother who only sips bandwidth versus the bandwidth hog um, guzzling bandwidth, you know. Um, so if you have one band of pricing, one, one rate for everybody, the rate's going to go up, the minimum rate's going to go up, and you're going to have the the more efficient uh, users of bandwidth, or the more frugal, I should say, maybe uh, users, subsidizing the bandwidth hogs. So actually, tiering uh, can be good for consumers. Um, the more you consume, the more you pay. That's how the marketplace uh, rations limited resources. Um, so we can have a policy debate over that. But I think there is hesitation uh, from folks I've talked to in the internet service provider community, the broadband community, regardless of the technology used. There's a hesitancy there. Um, uh, to go forward until they know what the resolution of this uh, court case will be. Gentleman in the second row. Hi. Um, hello. Steve Miller. So I have two questions, one for Commissioner McDowell, one for Commissioner McDowell, and, and for Craig. First one is you mentioned that there was a um, – a standard of, 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 of congressional confusion about congressional intent in the Arlington slash Chevron case. Is that in the in the language itself of the case or is that just something that's, that's asserted? And, and if so, would the would the Section 706 or other parts of the Communications Act be grounds for that amb ambivalence in, in, the, in the view of the courts? Second question is about Craig's analogy about the uh, Postal Service and about the different services there. If you're going to make that analogy to the, the broadband you know, market, wouldn't the commission's uh, uh, explicit, you know, uh, exception for for reasonable network management accommodate those different models? So, I, I don't. I do not think my legal interpretation of the act is that it is not ambiguous regarding the commission's authority to economically regulate um, broadband internet access. 
that the statute is actually silent in that regard, and that 706, that was not the intent at all of 706, and this wasn't even envisioned during the 1996 Act. There's no record of that whatsoever. Uh, so if you have a vivid imagination, you can conjure authority from any, any word, I guess. Um, you know, we're, we're lawyers, we all went to law school, and we, we know that you can debate, you know, two sides of uh, any of the weakest cases. Um, so the point I was making, though, is that the statute is silent, and so from the Arlington case, that means the agency does not have the discretion to determine its own jurisdiction. If uh, the statute um, was ambiguous, and one could argue under Section 254, when we did universal service reform, Section 254 is actually rather lengthy, and there's, uh, can, can we support information services with a universal service subsidy or only telecommunication services? One could argue it's ambiguous, uh, but ultimately, we had the authority to do that. That's sort of a classic Chevron deference interpretation, and that's why I thought we had uh, the FCC had the authority to uh, implement the reform that we did in 2011. So that's just I'm just using it as an example of what is ambiguity. There's actually language kind of on both sides, and uh, it wasn't necessarily most artfully written, but the thrust of what Congress is saying, I think, it w was clear there. In the case of the regulation, economic regulation of internet network management. Uh, there is no language, there is no evidence of legislative intent whatsoever, and therefore it's not ambiguous, it's silent, it doesn't have the authority, and the commission cannot determine its own jurisdiction. And to, to answer your question usually about my mail analogy, there, there are actually two different things they were talking about that, are, that potentially get conflated. One is, uh, is the prioritization, right? My analogy was bulk mail versus two-day mail, where all, pack, all packages in that case are delivered, but some of them may be prioritized over others. The other has to do with two-sided markets and, and price experimentation. You know, on the first, it's an interesting question. You can get into lots of debates to say, let's say I as a consumer have a service that's monitoring my heart and feeding data back to my doctor, and I want to pay for prioritization of that traffic over my kids watching you know, water skiing squirrels on YouTube, um, which, my kids may have a different view, yes. <laughs> you may have a different view, but I personally would like to prioritize my heart monitoring traffic if I had such a service. You know, what, what I think we can almost certainly say is that um, th there are going to be lots of views expressed and people standing up, as we have seen in some of the other issues where people say, you can't do that, you can do that, and it raises uncertainty. Mm -hmm. and, and to Rob's point, that actually does free some innovation. On the price experimentation question, which then gets, it's, it's a different angle on the mail analogy, right? When I had a subscription with Netflix uh, for DVDs, Netflix paid for the DVDs to be mailed to me and they paid for them to be shipped back again. When I buy certain things from Amazon, they pay for the shipping, right? This is a fairly common commercial model that goes, uh, goes way back through lots and lots of different industries. And yet, when this Wall Street Journal story appeared uh, about ESPN, and I, I can't speak to wh whom uh, ESPN is negotiating with, but there were people who immediately came out and said that spirit that violates, if not the letter, at least the spirit of, of net neutrality, something that is an application of a very old business model simply to a new area of technology. And if you think about it, it exists today, uh, the, the Amazon Kindle. If you download a book on Amazon Kindle, you don't pay for airtime. That's bundled into the price of the book, and uh, Amazon works out the commercial arrangements with whatever wireless carrier it has a contract with. So it, this is not an uncommon thing, and yet you saw a lot of stir uh, about that issue. So I would argue strangely that does not violate net neutrality, but we see the debate and that does raise uncertainty and that does to some degree cause hesitancy in uh, business model innovation. Actually, I, I just wanted to weigh in uh, just uh, briefly on the, um, the you, you mentioned the uh, price experimentation, uh, Rob, you, you mentioned that as well. W one thing to keep in mind is what are the goals here? Are the goals to have uh, all the content providers have a, you know, they pay the same and they have an equal um, access to people? Or is the goal to expand access to the internet? Because price discrimination does provide a better deal for some people. And the grandma who's just sipping content may be able to pay a lot less. So you actually might be able to reach a much larger population of people if you allow for this kind of experimentation, this kind of price discrimination to happen. So, so realize there are effects on both, both sides of the market. And with that, I promised everyone I'd get them out by 1.30. Uh, I'm sure that the panelists will uh, entertain 
questions uh, afterwards, but please join me in thanking this wonderful panel for being here. Turn your phone on, Harold. All right. <laughs>